Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our Arctic event. Um, and so I wanted to welcome everyone to the U.S. Center. As you know, this is a public diplomacy space that is organized by the United States Department of State um, as an opportunity to share with you some of our key climate initiatives. Um, we have with us today a really fantastic panel, um, mostly from outside the U.S. government, but also we have some folks here from our White House Council on Environmental Quality, as well as from NASA. Um, so today's event is intended to highlight climate change impacts in the Arctic. Although this important region can often seem distant, our speakers will describe the changes occurring today, the impact on Arctic communities and ecosystems, and the implications for the rest of the world. We do have a web audience with us today who's going to be watching this online. So for those of you online who have questions, uh, you can use the Twitter hashtag AskUSCenter, and we'll do our best to get your questions to our speakers. So today's event is going to start um, with opening remarks from Mike Boots, who is the acting chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and he's going to speak on U.S. Arctic policy broadly. Uh, NASA scientist and um, astronaut Pierre Sellers will then show us the changes occurring in the Arctic on the hyperwall in the back of the room. Global climate scientist Bob Carell will then walk us through the science behind the changes in the Arctic and how these changes impact the rest of the world. Gwyn Tarasca, who is our senior policy advisor at the Center for American Progress, will provide an overview of key sources of black carbon and methane and how the Arctic Council can lead action to address these important pollutants. Finally, Rosemary Atuangaruak, former mayor of Nunquist and tribal liaison for Alaska Wilderness League, is speaking to us from Alaska, so we're going to have her on the screen, to provide a perspective from our Arctic communities. So thank you very much for joining. And Mike, if you want to take the floor. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. It's uh, great to be here with this group of people who are going to spend a little time talking about uh, the impacts of a changing climate on Arctic communities. And uh, I think we are all here at this gathering because we uh, recognize the threat of climate change. We understand the urgency of climate change, uh, and both in terms of uh, curbing our emissions, but also making sure that we are protecting our communities from the impacts that are too late to avoid. And there's really no place where climate change uh, is more apparent than in the Arctic. And in the U.S., uh, uh, for the U.S., the Alaskan Arctic uh, has warmed at twice the pace uh, of other parts of the country. And the impacts there are being felt in very real and visible ways, which we are going to hear about through the course of this presentation today. But that includes things like early spring snowmelt and glacier retreat and drier landscapes and warmer permafrost and, of course, the loss of sea ice. And those dynamics are the same dynamics that are being felt by all eight Arctic nations as they struggle uh, with this reality. And so focusing on the Arctic provides uh, a very useful lens in which to see both the current threat and some of the future uh, possibilities and risks, uh, but to also think about how the nations around the Arctic uh, can come together to tackle it. President Obama has recognized uh, the importance of both the issue of climate change, but specifically as how it relates to the health of Arctic communities. Last year, we released our first national strategy for the Arctic, uh, something that was meant to coalesce the different policies and programs throughout the federal government around the issues of safety and security, around stewardship, and around international partnerships in the Arctic. And all of those themes have to be addressed in the context of the dramatic changes that are happening uh, to the environment and to the accessibility of the region. And so the national strategy and the implementation plan uh, that we put together look at those issues through the lens of how you best prepare these communities to be as resilient as can be to both the climate changes and a whole host of other socioeconomic stressors that that region is feeling. And so to do this, we need to take significant action. We need to uh, have the best available science and tools. And so we are increasing the quantity uh, and the quality and the availability of some of our regional environmental modeling uh, and science, uh, which we'll get the benefit of seeing a little bit more of uh, later. We're also focused on improving our predictive capacity and capabilities and models for weather and sea ice and other coastal hazards. And we're working to identify the role and the value um, 
of the sensitive Arctic ecosystems that climate change uh, poses such great risk to. And, uh, and we're ensuring that resource use, whether it's oil and gas activities or any other resource use, are being done in a manner that really maximizes safety and response uh, and ecosystem protections. But those actions that we are taking at the federal level certainly cannot be looked at in a vacuum. As, as you all know, the Arctic is such an interconnected place, uh, both culturally and uh, environmentally. And so to attempt to look at these things as a stovepiped uh, kind of approach would be uh, unrealistic. Uh, and so that's why international partnerships really sit at the core of this national strategy that we put together um, uh, this year. Next year, the U.S. assumes the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, and we will, in that venue, Secretary Kerry and others, will continue to emphasize the importance of these partnerships as we build on all of the efforts that our predecessors, um, the Canadians, uh, have focused on in their term as chairman. Um, and we are working now to develop a consensus around what the shared agenda of the Council should be. Uh, during that two-year period. Our initial proposed framing uh, for that agenda really reflects this idea as one Arctic, uh, around shared opportunities, around shared challenges, around shared responsibilities. And addressing the impacts of climate change uh, will be a key component of that agenda, sort of integrated throughout the rest of the pieces that we will be focused on, which include economic and living conditions, but also marine safety, um, uh, security, and stewardship as well. So uh, that's just a sense of both sort of the work we're doing domestically and our new focus as we turn to 2015, uh, the role that the Arctic Council can play. Uh, but I just want to emphasize how, how central we think uh, the work in the Arctic around climate change sits in the President's Climate Action Plan, and that it really is a test bed and in many cases, uh, such a visible place for us to look at both the impacts and the challenges, but also to really think about what um, both public sector and private sector and then international cooperation can mean to tackle that problem. And with that, I think I will stop and let us uh, get on to the rest of the presentations. So thank you. Thanks, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what we know is happening in the Arctic and uh, touch on a few of the things that we don't know about. Now, you're all going to risk whiplash by turning around and looking at the screen behind you. And if you want to file any lawsuits, please give them to the Department of State and not to NASA. So, all right. So here's what we know. Uh, this is surface observed temperature field in 1884. This is a compilation of all the measurements that those Victorians and friends did back then. Actually, it's good data. And we're going to look at how these data run forward in time to the present day. Are you ready? By the way, the uh, yellow spots mean warmer than average. The blue spots mean cooler than average over the period. OK, here we go. Keep your eye on it. Nope. Marco. Hands off. Okay, can you go back arrow? There we go, all right, now. Here we go, forward in time. So as you can see, the world is warming up. You'll see more yellow appearing, but you also see something else happening in the Northern Hemisphere if you watch carefully. Coming into the 1950s now. 70s, acceleration in the 80s. And that's today. So, okay, it's warmer everywhere, as you can see, just about, but it's two and a half times as warm as the global average in the north. And that's because of the sea ice uh, albedo feedback. So every time I, I melt a nice white piece of ice, I expose black seawater, that absorbs the sun's rays better, it warms up the water a bit, it melts more ice. Pretty obvious, huh? Okay, so what can we see? Hey, Marit, can you bang the button? I don't think, I think this has run out of oomph. Okay. All right, this, we've been uh, using a satellite to track uh, Arctic sea ice extent, just the area, not the thickness, all right, since 1979. This is a microwave instrument. It works through clouds, it works in the dark, and it tells you the aerial extent of sea ice. 
Now we're looking at the minima at the end of the salama and tracking that over time. And you can see we start out at about six and a half million square kilometers. And then recently we get a bit of a nosedive. There we go. It's one. And another. A bit of a rebound. And we're waiting to see the numbers this year. So it turns out that this downturn uh, was underpredicted by our models uh, the last time around in IPCC AR4. And there's been some uh, corrections done to the latest round of models, but still, this was a surprise. This is sea ice area. It's not, uh, doesn't say anything about thickness. We don't know really enough about thickness, and we won't know until we get our satellite up there with a LIDAR that can measure ice thickness. So that's coming up in 2016, 2017. Next slide, please. OK, just to sort of uh, give you an idea of the complexity of this system, this is the same satellite microwave data phased over time and during the seasons. You can see it shrinking. It's kind of like a great sort of uh, octopus or something. It squidges itself around between all the channels. It uh, moves around with currents and with wind fields. It's quite a complicated process. However, raw energy drives the total extent for the most part. Though you can find on some years, when the wind pattern's different, this stuff gets piled up against one edge of the, uh, the ocean or the other. By the way, at the start of the observation period, we had large fields of what we call multi-year ice. That was ice that had been there you know, four, five, six years old. Now there's very little of that left. The ice that we have is this year's ice or the previous year's, previous year's ice are not much older than that. Next slide, please, Merit. OK, just showing the wind fields that push around the ice. We can use uh, general circulation models that uh, describe the wind fields very accurately and also the air temperature fields. And this gives us a very good handling on being able to check our satellite measurements and do a better job of modeling sea ice. Sea ice thinning is still a problem. We don't know really how to model that. We're working hard on it. So a whole lot of you know, the university community, NASA, NOAA people, we're, we're knocking ourselves out on that. But we have the tools, as you can see. This is a general circulation model with a coupled ice-ocean atmosphere system. Next, please. Uh, we'll skip this one. Next, please. Next. Yeah, it's the wrong pole. You guys don't want to see that. Next, please. All right, so last thing I'm going to talk about is a new technology for measuring how much ice we have. This is the GRACE satellite system. These are two satellites that fly around the world several hundred kilometers apart, not like that, in other words. And they track the distance between them with a radio beam to uh, within one hundredth the width of a human hair. They know the separation between them. Every time the lead satellite goes over a large ice mass, it gets accelerated, a large sort of dense mass on the surface. It accelerates away from the trailer. And likewise, when the other guy catches up with it. By doing a whole lot of math, you can figure out the gravity anomalies on the Earth's surface. And that way, you can tell changes in ice. You can actually weigh the amount of ass, uh, ice on Greenland and Antarctica. Next, please. So what did we learn? OK, for Greenland, since the period of record, since GRACE was launched 2003, what we see is that the ice declines, uh, the ice melts in the summer. You get a bit more top up in the winter with snowfall than it goes down the summer. But notice how that the trend is overall downwards. OK, watch that. OK, so you're wondering what the units are on the, uh, what is a gigaton of ice? You're looking at about 1,000 gigatons of ice disappearing there. A gigaton is one cubic kilometer of ice, which is a very large block of ice. All right? So there's 1,200 gigatons have fallen off Greenland into the ocean. Next, please. Uh, next, uh, we had a LIDAR satellite up there that was measuring ice thickness, and it conked out a few years ago, and we're busy building a replacement. Until then, we're forced to use aircraft to try and fill in the data gap. So we have this uh, thing called Operation Ice Bridge, two aircraft going to the North Pole and the South Pole every year in Greenland, and mapping the ice fields with uh, LIDARs. 
it, we can't cover the same area that we could with a satellite, obviously. Um, but this is the best we can do during the gap, and that's why it's called Ice Bridge, because it's a gap between two satellites. Next, please. So what we're working on here is this is ISAT-2. This will launch in 2016 or 2017. It's a six-beam LIDAR system that will not only tell us the thickness of the ice and the extent, but uh, also it will we'll be able to work out velocity of ice, so how, f how fast it's moving. So glacier movements will be able to get out of this as well. And I think one more, and I think I'll stop. Yeah, this is, this is a good one. So this is ice mass balance. We're using different methods, independent methods, to figure out how much ice is being lost. Uh, let's see, going to the top is input-output model in red, uh, radar altimetry, laser altimetry, and GRACE, which is that gravity system. Completely different physics, or mathematics in some cases, for these estimates. Uh, GRIS is the Greenland ice sheet. That's that 200 gigatons a year that I was telling you about. Uh, then you go all the way down to East Antarctic ice sheet, and then the total of everything, Antarctic ice sheet plus Greenland ice sheet on the far right. Estimates diverge a bit, but they're still centering around 300 uh, gigatons a year. We're going to hopefully sharpen that up with uh, better observations in the future. So there you go. We're losing ice everywhere. Um, in Antarctica, it's a bit more complicated. There's some small gains in some places, larger losses in the other places more recently. But uh, we've, we've got the goods and the tools, basically, to track this pretty well. And we're going to keep a close eye on it towards the end of the decade. Thank you for your attention. Is this on? Good. I'll, I'll use this until I start wandering. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here and to be able to chat and pick up where Pears left off and Mike left off. And what are the consequences of, of all of this? I, um, I'd like to remind us as to why we're here. There is a common purpose, and we often just stabilize greenhouse gas, but it really has a lot more to do with humanity, about food production and enabling economic development in a reasoned way. So that's the background. I want to take a minute and raise some issues with you about how we got here. Uh, <clears throat> there's 800,000 years of ice. Each of those is an ice age, but you can see at the zero time, we are now in a whole new world compared to the ice that we have analyzed, analyzed over, the, over recent years, at least 800,000, and I think you'd agree it's probably a lot longer. So <clears throat> we have 400 parts per uh, um, PPM, per per million, and that's kind of like a GDP of the, of the world we're dealing with. It's a simple number, and it tells you something about what's going awry. Now, what I want to do is show you a little video starting in 1750, which is essentially the start of the Industrial Revolution, and I want you to watch the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that are going in. They're starting at roughly two. This video will run fairly quickly. Here we go. You can see it starts in England, as everyone knows, no big surprise. Um, <clears throat> and for quite a few decades, it's pretty much there. But now you'll see around the change in 1800, it starts to move into it starts to move into Western Europe, Germany, and, and suddenly the United States starts to light up as we became a country in 1776, and we took on this idea of energy as a engine of development, and it has been a powerfully effective one, and has enabled us to even be in this room today. As we get close to the mid-century past, things really light up. <clears throat> and by uh, the time we get to today, I'll take you there, it's up above 10,000. We started at two. So that's four orders of magnitude of emissions have changed in just 260 or plus years. So we really have adopted fossil fuels as the energy of, of our development, and it's not all that bad. 
And we went from 780,000 million people to well over 2 billion, a tenfold increase in humanity. Now here's another look at it. The last 10,000 years have been very stable. In fact, during that time, very modest increases in CO2 in the atmosphere. Going back to that PPM again, 0 0.002 for almost 10,000 years. We're now up to in the two to three range. So we're looking at a thousand fold increase in the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. So you can see we really have moved into a new era. It's a new enterprise, it's a new world. And while we need to address that, uh, my opinion is that all the tools are necessary to move into a, a new energy world over, over the decades ahead. Something very special happened, of course, during that uh, 250 years that I showed you in the movie. And this is a simple way to show what, what Pear told you about. But let me look at it from another point of view. If we run models, and if we run a model subject to these conditions, that is what the nations have put into the Copenhagen Accord four years ago, I guess five years, five years ago, the, they're not commitments, they're targets, like 80% reduction by 2050, and you know, the, you know the arena. And if you run that, these are the sorts of things you see in the high Arctic. We're talking about five to eight degrees warming up in there by the mid-century, and maybe uh, above 10 or 11 by the end of the century. So what does all that mean? What does it mean for the Arctic? I want to look at three things, sea level, and the opening of the seaway, and how it affects sea weather extremes. Let's look at sea level first. What's happening? Paris gave you a kind of nice look at that, but I want to dial down. Where does the water come from that's melting? Uh, something of the order of half of it now is coming from these moulons and the melting off in the coastal margins, just shedding and going into the sea. And those two waters are contributing to sea level rise. But then we have another source, and that is the calving, which has increased in many places by factors of three to five. So we're putting them in more rapidly. The scale of that one there is about a kilometer across. And uh, there can be some argument, but I'm going to propose or suggest that if you put the IPCC and a lot of work that's been done in the last uh, couple of years on sea level projections, I think we're over a meter by the end. And that's a mean value and one we have to worry about because it has the potential of some surprises in there, like what happens in Antarctica. And if that's the case, we're looking about four-tenths of a, a meter by mid-century. The trouble with sea level, it's lumpy. Doesn't it even? The far western Pacific might be three to five times the global average. I live in Miami, Florida. It's 50% higher than the global mean. That's why you hear about, uh, why you hear about Miami. So in Alaska, one of our countries, uh, uh, states, of course, their storm surges are now being raised by the bottom. The sea is coming up, and so the storms are higher. And these uh, are causing erosion of some, of some of the homes along the coastal margin. And let me just show you. There's one in, in Shishmarif where the sea, which used to protect its island, Berry Island, by year-round ice, the ice is gone, so those storms can now get at it. This particular picture was taken right after the shoreline moved 125 feet in one storm. The Barrier Island is less than a half a mile wide, so this, this is among many that are going to have to move. You've seen pictures like this for a meter, and I'm just going to suggest that's sort of the, the target we're thinking about, at least on the best of science. This is where I live, and that's what it looks like in King Tide uh, period. Pear and I were, he was giving a talk with Senator Nelson on the whole con prospect of sea level in South Florida. Some call it ground zero, at least in the US. So let's talk a little bit about <coughs> the effect of the opening of the seaway. Really, if you get there, you'll see pictures like this all over. 
what's happening, and, and you've seen a little bit of it, but here's a dramatic picture. The blue line is what we thought from all our models, and Mother Nature behaves according to red. And you've seen some of this picture imposed on another image, and I'm going to bypass mine. Uh, and what does that mean for people? We know that the Arctic has been inhabited by uh, Inuits and Samis and others for maybe seven to 9,000 years. And in Greenland, which I go to frequently, uh, it's become a serious problem because the ice is no longer a, a, their highway along the coast. They can't go along with their dog sleds. And several of the northern villages up near Thule have just killed their dogs and gone on welfare because they ha can't live any other way. And it's all because the seals are not accessible uh, for, for food for their dogs. The opening of the seaway will transform things. Whoops. Uh-oh. Didn't like something. I may need some help up here. You have to bear with me. I catch up here. Probably overloaded the system with stuff. All right. We're close to back. There we go. Uh, the opening of the seaway really is going to transform things. Um, and I'm going to go by because you, I just want to stop here just for a second. It, you will see that the, the loss is of the order on area about 10% per decade. That's a percent per year. And if we continue on that, we will not have sea. Now, the rule of 72 applies if we assume that that mathematics. So certainly by the end of the century, we're going to have some rather wide open parts of the sea. And I'll miss that one for catch up with you here. Here are some of the sea routes. I work with the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese primarily who are interested in the, in the new trade routes. Those three countries produce over 92% of all the ships at sea above 100 tons. And 100 tons is not very big. My sailboat weighs 10, and it's not very big at all. So though those opening seaways are going to have all kinds of new trade implications, oil and gas development. And here's one that uh, if you take a minute and look at some of these, hard minerals are very prevalent in the high Arctic. Things like palladium, 40% of the global, 22% uh, of the nickel, diamonds, 20%, etc. So there are lots of rich rich uh, things that are going to be open to all peoples as they try to develop their nations. So some of the global trends that affect weather, more frequent extremes, more, more heat extremes, um, stronger uh, sociological cycles, and there will be more events such as the one we've had with Sandy in New York City. Um, and here is another image. I don't think you showed this, did you? Um, this is a jet stream when we think of it here on lower latitudes. And watch it carefully. It meanders and it's going deeper. In fact, I climbed on an airplane recently in Miami. It's a normally two hour and 45 minute flight and we landed in an hour and a half. Because the jet stream came down so far we were on 250, 300 mile tailwind. And as a consequence of that, it's, it's taking this thing and elongating it. And there are all kinds of physics that suggest that would happen, but it's a fact. And the other thing is it squeezes the peaks together. And then you ask, so what happens when that happens, when you move down? In that valley, in that valley between there, what's going to happen? It's going to pull cold air. And in the United States a few weeks ago, yeah, it's some wicked cold air, and that, this is the baby that caused it. And we can connect this back to the climate system and how it works. I'm going to pass that one up. But the polar vortex also causes dramatic differences in the high Arctic. Got regions that are much colder, regions that are much warmer. And here's the bottom line. Those differences 
are plus or minus 27 degrees in one instant. Huge difference. I called up some of my colleagues in, in uh, Greenland, and they said, you know, we have not had any snow in Nuke all winter. Unheard of. Sea ice in many of the ports does not ever return in the, in the winter time. And it's all because of this polar vortex and how the behavior of the system, which you know, he indicated what are some of the physics. When you take the ice away, it doesn't matter whether it's land or water, it becomes black. It becomes an absorber of heat. That heat then re-radiates into the system. And for, for um, Inuit people, which we will hear more about in a minute, this is my, this is my um, hockey stick. There is an event called guave. And guave is when uh, you get a lot of rain in the middle of the winter when the animals are trying to feed their last feeding. And it creates ice lenses. And those ice lenses then cause the herd to die. You will lose 40, 60% of a, of a herd. And you can see over time they occur maybe on the time frame of of a few tens of decades, a few decades. But in the last decade, we've had, well, I think, six or five. So we've got an uh, amplification of that process. So we're working really closely with these folks to try to help them accommodate those developments. I want to close with um, an idea that the Arctic really is a bellwether and that there is a common future for all of us, to borrow uh, a phrase. And uh, I want to look at three things. Uh, energy growth is around 2% per year, and there's every indication that by all the folks that that will continue to grow like that for at least a couple more decades. The annual growth of consumption, this is a calculation of over 30 or 40 elements of feed and housing and all the things that we need, that's growing at about 3.5%. Those two things are obviously connected. And our GDP growth is globally at about 3.6, and uh, the indication that there's not going to be a change there. And those are going to require more energy, more stuff. And then you ask, by the rule of 72, this stuff's going to double on the time scale of 20 to 30 years. Those are all within the horizon of people sitting in this room. And that kind of thing we've got to build into our adaptation strategies because everything is moving very, very rapidly. And the Arctic is giving us an indication that what you see up there a generation from now, you'll see at much lower latitudes. So human well-being is at stake. Uh, and there are these interactions. And to uh, just wrap up, the stakes are really high. Humanity is at risk, as is the planet and all of its natural systems. Oops, I lost it here. I want you to see this. You know this one. This is um, Earthrise, taken on December 24th, 1968. It's what none of us ever see, but this is, if you're on the moon, this is what it would be. Pretty spectacular picture, in my view. And with that, I will let you uh, read Kofi Annan's comments about what this is all about. The stakes really are high. And until we acknowledge the all-encompassing nature of the f problems we face, we're probably going to fall short. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, so thanks very much, Julie, and everyone for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's clear from Bob's talk that the Arctic is in need of near-term temperature control. Um, so I'm here to discuss the uh, mitigation strategy that can help us that can help us get there, that can help us moderate um, Arctic warming in the near term. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, black carbon and methane. Um, a second thing I'm going to discuss, if you could change the slide. 
back up one. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so I'm going to suggest that the, there we go. I'm going to suggest that the Arctic Council is potentially a very effective forum for promoting the, um, the sorts of mitigation strategies that we need to rein in um, near-term warming in the Arctic. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Arctic Council is an intergovernmental forum. Um, it has eight member nations, including the United States, Canada, Russia, and the five Nordic countries. Um, it also includes uh, 12 observer nations, um, which now include China, India, um, the UK, uh, Germany, France, uh, Japan, Korea, and many others. Um, so the US assumed the chairmanship of this body in 2015. Um, and I think it could be a, a major opportunity and a perfect time, actually, to lead some actions that can help protect this region. So first on the mitigation strategy, and I'll start with black carbon. Um, so black carbon, as you may know, is, is, is not a gas, it's particulate matter. Um, and it's emitted upon incomplete combustion in a, num in a number of sectors. Um, so firstly, transportation, primarily diesel engines. Um, secondly, domestic cooking and heating. Thirdly, agricultural burning um, and wildfires. And then fourth, gas flaring from fossil fuel production um, and marine shipping. Um, so what's different about black carbon in contrast to um, carbon dioxide and even methane is that it has a very short atmospheric lifetime. Um, it, it's removed from the atmosphere within mere days. And this gives it a very interesting property, which is that it's not evenly distributed around the globe. Um, and this means that it has a localized warming impact, a regional impact. Um, so you, when you're looking at the Arctic, for example, only black carbon emissions from north of the 40th parallel affect, affect the Arctic region. Um, and it affects the region in, in two ways. First of all, there's the atmospheric effect. Um, so when you get the particles in the atmosphere, the particles absorb light and radiate energy. And then there's a secondary effect that the particles coat the snow and ice, um, which, reduces, um, which reduces reflectivity and causes warming and melting. Um, so countries that contribute to warming um, through black carbon in this region, they include the countries you would expect in the Arctic region, but they also include countries like China, which contributes, for example, 15% of black carbon emissions um, that affect this region, and also, for example, non-Arctic European countries, which collectively contribute about 37% of black carbon emissions that affect this region. Um, so black carbon is one of the components that's necessary for um, a mitigation strategy that can help rein in near-term Arctic warming. I'm just going to quickly skip a few slides so we can have time for other speakers. Um, the other component is methane. Um, and methane has um, an atmospheric lifetime of 12 years, so longer than black carbon, but quite a bit less, obviously, than carbon dioxide, which can hang around the atmosphere for millennia. Um, also, in contrast to CO2, it has a much higher warming potential. So over a 100-year lifetime, um, it's about 30 times more powerful, and it gets up to 85 times more powerful when you're looking at a shorter time frame, like a 20-year 20, 20 time frame. Um, Globally, the top sectors are agriculture, oil and gas, and then waste and um, wastewater management. And if you're looking at all of the Arctic Council nations, so both observers and, um, and members, um, the, top, um, the top emitters are China, the US, Russia, and India. And these aren't just the top four emitters in this group. They're actually the top four emitters worldwide as well. Um, so I find methane to actually be in, really interesting in the, in the context of the Arctic. 
Um, and that's because on the face of it, you wouldn't necessarily think that it was relevant to the region. Um, it's, it's distributed evenly throughout the atmosphere, so you wouldn't think that it would have maybe a regional effect. But it is relevant for two reasons. Um, firstly, the Arctic is in need of near-term temperature control, as many people have said. Um, and because methane has a, a short atmospheric uh, lifetime, you'll see the benefit of methane reductions quickly, right, within years rather than within decades. Um, if you're acting on CO2 alone, you see those benefits by 2040, but not within the next few years. Um, the second reason, and I think that not very many people possibly know this in the policy world, is that um, methane mitigation actually has a disproportionate benefit for the Arctic, which is interesting, right? So even though it's distributed evenly around the globe, um, when you mitigate methane, you actually see two to three times the warming benefit, the avoided warming in the Arctic than you see generally, and that's because of Arctic amplification. And if you have questions about that, I refer you to Bob. Um, So when you add up both methane mitigation and black carbon mitigation, you, you can see really significant results. Um, UNEP uh, estimates a 0.7 degree reduction in warming by 2040. Uh, similarly, the World Bank estimates a, a one degree reduction in, in um, warming by 2050. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because I think it bears repeating, that I, I definitely don't mean to imply that reductions in short the forces like black carbon and methane on the one hand and reductions in carbon dioxide on the other hand, I don't want to imply that they're fungible, right? They're, they're not. You need to act on both immediately and you need to act on both simultaneously to have a chance at achieving some measure of climate safety. Um, and this is my, my favorite uh, my favorite slide that demonstrates it. It's from Drew Shendell and others. Um, and you can see that right, if you act on carbon dioxide alone, right, you don't see that benefit until 2040. If you act on short-lived forces alone, that's kind of the bottom line, you see an immediate benefit, but it's actually worse in the long run than the CO2 only scenario. And you'll see those two lines meet around 2070. So right, to, to stay within some measure of climate safety, um, you need to do both simultaneously and immediately. Um, so I just wanted to make the case for leveraging the Arctic Council to try to um, promote this mitigation strategy. Um, the U.S. assumes the leadership under you know, Secretary Kerry and Admiral Papp um, in 2015. And I think many of us in the NGO community um, were focused heavily on Paris, which we ought to be. Um, but the Arctic Council, I just wanted to underline, um, it's, it's not a distraction. I think it offers a real opportunity to try to protect this region. Uh, so I know that the US is taking this actually very seriously, and they have a very impressive agenda, which includes climate change in basically every corner of their agenda. Um, and I think I would just want to urge um, that the United States and others perhaps lead Arctic Council members and observers in you know, coming forward to make commitments or, you know, in the context of this COP, to make contributions um, towards limiting both black carbon and methane. Right? So just like we're trying to do here, limit GHG emissions right post-2020, here you could have a, a complementary forum in which you would um, try to reduce black carbon and methane in, in the very near term. So I know that there's probably suspicion about a multiplicity of forums, a multiplicity of initiatives, um, is a danger of forum shopping, as it's called. Um, but there are a number of reasons why I think the Arctic Council is particularly well positioned to act on this issue. Um, first, of all, they sh first of all, they have a heightened and common um, stake in, in mitigating the problem. Um, um, and then secondly, which I think is interesting, reductions among Arctic nations and observers alone, without even the participation of the rest of the globe, could make a huge difference. Um, members and observers collectively contribute 42% of anthropogenic methane emissions and 60% of black carbon emissions. 
Um, a third reason why I think the Arctic Council could be particularly effective is that it's a, a smaller, less cumbersome forum than some other forums might be. Um, and in the, the words of Todd Stern, and this was, this was Stern um, describing the Montreal Protocol, but I think it's apt here as well, it could be a forum that leads to a greater level of focus, intensity, and candor than you might see in a, um, a bulkier body. So maybe this would be something that could you know, implement some near-term solutions. Um, also, as we've seen in the other presentations, the impacts in the Arctic are just stunning, right? Um, they're stunning and threatening. Um, and that, coupled with the fact that we can actually do something to, um, to moderate the problem in the near term, should give the Arctic Council, I think, a really powerful narrative to um, persuade others around the globe to make similar sorts of commitments. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying that I think it's an opportune time for the US to take on this, this chairmanship. Um, I think there are a number of factors aligning that make this um, a good time to, to really get some achievements in this area. Um, on the US side, the US is a credible leader right now with its, um, with its methane programs and with its effective diesel standards, for example. Um, on the science, and, uh, the science and technology front, you know, the science is in, we have the technology, it's affordable, um, and the US can build on the impressive and in-depth research of the Arctic Council Task Force, um, which shows that we have enough scientific knowledge to take action now, right? We don't have to wait for further monitoring. Um, and then lastly, I think on the, the international atmosphere, um, I think we might have some momentum now, as many have said. Um, there might be some new political will. Um, and as we talk about the sort of the feedback effects, um, the various feedback effects in the Arctic, perhaps we could see a feedback effect in momentum, with momentum in the COP towards you know, post-2020 mitigation and momentum in the Arctic Council with the sooner mitigation um, of these powerful pollutants. Thank you. And so we have our final speaker who will be actually Skyping in from Alaska. Um, and so this is Rosemary Atwangarua. Um, and so I want to see if we can pull up her slides. There she is. Hi, Rosemary. We can see you. Can you hear us OK? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Rosemary had to travel all the way to Fairbanks to be able to uh, use their system to be able to do this. And Rosemary has some slides that she has sent. If we could pull those up. Great. OK, Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming to this panel and learning about our concerns. My name is Rosemary Tiazin Kulualik Kinwan Superalik Superaktok Piyok Atongarok. My mother is Mabel New York Peterson. My father is Julian Don Pierce, and my stepfather is Carl Peterson. Um, my mothers had met the boats that came, and they brought epidemics with them. During this time, she traveled by dog sled into the coastal areas where these activities were occurring. This time, the Arctic was seen as the international importance for the Cold War era. But for my mom, she lost her parents during this time. And she was taken into a hospital in Washington State to be treated for this illness that she acquired. She was used to share translation because she was able to learn the English language and she was able to learn many native languages in this process. But the view of the Arctic at the time was not the view we had. The Arctic was being used for international whaling and our whaling numbers had declined. We also were facing terrible declines at that time. We as a nupiate must work in this process and come to the tables that are before us because our lands and waters are changing. We must work in the local venue, the regional venue, the state venue, the national venue, and internationally to bring our concerns about the importance of our tradition, our culture, and our future generations. Next slide. I am 
and the Inupiat. I live on the Arctic coast at the very top of the map. We have over 200 tribes in Alaska and we are all facing various changes. I cannot speak for all of the tribes. I can only share some of the little concerns that I have in a few minutes that I have to share with you. Next slide. As my mother had met these boats and lost her parents and then went elsewhere, she also was brought back to the Arctic after many years. And she was able to take and teach the English, English language in the village of Atpasuk. We also were take, facing changes and she was then also encouraged to become a nurse. Our lands were facing changes and many of our people did not get to vote for statehood. We did vote for the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, and at that time, we knew the cost to tribes was very high, and we decided this cost was too much. We said no. Next slide. Our elders knew about the oil. Uh, please stop the forward and just keep it on slide uh, with the date, 1968. We knew about the oil. It was a good light source. One of our elders, Sarah Pinnickdena, she would travel by dog sled to these areas and she would scoop it with her sail home spoon and she would put it in the sail boat. One of our other elders, Wesley Aiken, he talked about soaking sod in the oil seepage and bringing them with them as they traveled with the animals that were important to them. Joe Pitkant Sound said, we are the landlords of our lands. Next slide. Our lands continued to change, and there were many things that happened. We were facing rapid changes throughout our state. In the Arctic, things were happening rapidly. With the advent of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, there was negotiations that occurred to create the right-of-way. When the tribes were negotiated with, they talked about the importance of the tribes and how bad this would impact the tribes. But with the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, there were also Native allotments that were created. When the negotiations became between the individual and the process, many did not get consulted, and it changed the way the negotiations occurred, and we now have this tremendous infrastructure. Next slide, please. I started in the village as, with, the 2000, with the 1989. I started in the village in 1989 as a community health aide. I faced a lot of changes that were happening around the village. But I started and there was only one person that used medicines to help them breathe. As I continued working and finished my education, more and more people were having changes to the health. I asked many questions. The importance of our lands and waters was not well understood and the, there were changes that were happening affecting many different things in our lands and waters. And the, Concerns I continued to ask were about the changes that were affecting our ability to hunt and harvest in our lands and waters. Next slide. As these changes continued, there were things that were happening that were affecting our animals. This eagle is on the riverbank, and this happened after a rain in the summer. The eagle nest was disrupted, and the eagle was on the coast, on the bank. When we were sharing the concerns about this, it doesn't just affect us. This fledgling should grow and fly to many areas, and the loss of this eagle fledgling affects all the many areas where this eagle fledgling will fly. The many different birds that are associated with these lands and waters come to our area for renewal. They go to many other areas throughout the world, but their renewal is being impacted with the changes. One of our elders talked about one of the birds nesting nine days earlier within the last 10 years. Throughout all of her life, they always were born on and around her birthday to rapidly change to where now it is coming way before her birthday. There are also many birds that have not come back with other changes in our lands and waters, such as the, what has happened with the Exxon Valdez. These changes led to many concerns. Next slide. We are all at risk because these changes come into our bodies and into our future generations. These concerns come from all over the world and come into the Arctic, into our lands, our snow, our ice, into our foods, into our future generations. 
These concerns are very concerning to me because we have over 100 chemicals that have shown up in our breast milk study. And yet we have concerns to continue to increase our risk. Next slide. We all must engage in the process before us because the threat is real. This is an insight to burn. We are at risk throughout the Arctic nations that are at trying to develop the energy that is buried in the Arctic Ocean. And when doing this, we have learned the failures in our state. Next slide, please. These are one of the many herds that travel throughout the Arctic, and this is the porcupine caribou herd. But for me, this herd goes to an area of the Arctic coast where it is only the last 5% that is not open for oil and gas development. Next slide. As we face the changes with this oil and gas development, it affects us in many ways, whether or not the caribou cross the, the river to get to the cabin grounds, whether or not the insect blooms are occurring when the baby birds need them, whether or not there is the adequate growth when the baby animals need them for their renewal in the progress of their continued growth. These things are all affecting us in our daily lives. It's affecting the way that we store our foods. It's affecting the health and the safety of our foods as we store them. Next slide. There is a slide before this that shows the Alpine oil field. And in, this is a small development. They came to us and said that it would be a small footprint in the sand. And the reality is that it has become at this in industrial sprawl with over 500 acres of gravel placement. All of this changes the way the animals use this area and it affects us and how we go into these areas to harvest our foods together in these areas, whether or not the animals continue in these areas. It affects whether or not the fish are going to be coming out and being productive in these areas with the increase in temperatures, there's increased risk for parasites and concerns around the health and safety of the food and whether or not they're reproducing the way they are supposed to. Next slide. We have many areas that are very important, but we all must engage in this process because if this were to happen on the Yukon River where the Trans-Alaska Pipeline crosses over into the Arctic, it would uh, take only 49 hours to spread to the Arctic Ocean. We have other nations that put us all at risk because if there's an adverse event in a nearby place, the reality is the currents will carry what happens to us. Next slide. We have a beautiful place throughout our state, and when you work together, as the people of Bristol Bay have done, you can unite working with your city, your tribe, and your corporations to help understand the importance of their world-renowned fisheries. You can help to build the importance of the understanding internationally and nationally and protect these areas that are important for our future generations and not giving one resource extraction for another. The cost of us feeding our families are too important. It's the sharing of this process through the generations that must occur. Next slide. We're very concerned this process has continued. Next slide. The risk for us are real. This has happened then with the hurricane in the Gulf. And yet we have the ice to add to the pictures and their stream Arctic temperatures. Next slide. We still live our traditional ways. We have our caribou hunts that we have to sew these skin boats from the seal skin and we go out into the Arctic to harvest our, our whale. Next slide. We have many animals. They're very important. They all have their own story. Next slide. This is what happened from the Exxon Valdez. If this were to have happened in the Arctic, it would have gone from Point Hope to the Canadian border. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. We all have special people in our lives that are important to help us stay strong in this process. We must continue to work with this process and work in it and get into the many venues where we must deal with these issues that are before us. We have to educate those that are around us as well as those that are coming to the Arctic with hopes to change our lands and waters. We must share the importance of our tradition, our culture, the health of our people and our future generations. We must continue to engage in this process. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. We know we can do this change. 
we need to just transition. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Do we really want to let shell run up into the Arctic? We're holding this place for our future generations. Next slide. It's important that we really think about this and not just run off into wants and desires. And we, the reality is we must do what we need for our future generations. Next slide. This is a beautiful place, the Arctic, where we live. Next slide. Let's think about what are we doing in the Arctic and protect the health of our future generations and the health of us all. Thank you for learning about our concerns. Thank you, Rosemary, for that very interesting presentation. And so I'm going to ask our speakers to come back up. We've run out of time, but we did want to at least see if there are any questions for any of our speakers before we close the program. So are there any uh, questions from the audience? Please go ahead. about Hilton uh, China Dialogue. I have a question about the methane. Um, if, if the projections are accurate, we're looking at potential massive methane release from uh, melting tundra. Um, any kind of mitigation, though clearly it's all worth doing, but surely that's going to be dwarfed by methane release from natural processes. Okay. Um, to speak louder. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, methane release is a is a major problem, and um, even anthropogenic methane levels right now are expected to rise by I think 25 percent by 2030. Um, so I think that just underlines the the urgency of the situation, um, which is why I think it would be best to try to you know, rein in these pollutants in a form that could potentially move very quickly. Um. Any, other, any other questions from the audience? Questions? Perfect. Uh, thank you. My name is Leona. I'm uh, doing Arctic research at Dartmouth College, and I'm just curious as to um, stakeholder representation and public participation. I know that public diplomacy is a big part of the U.S.'s Arctic Council chairmanship agenda, and I'm curious in, as to, um, you know, Rosemary, maybe in your experience, um, but also from our other speakers, how you see the public engaging in in this, these conversations, and also how you see indigenous communities, young people, and women engaging as well. Um. I, I can take that. The Arctic Council has initiated a, a rather large study called uh, <coughs> Adaptation, Rapid Adaptation for a Rapidly Changing Arctic. And it's built completely on uh, participation at the ground level. And they're focusing on three regions, the Bering Sea, the uh, <coughs> um, Barrens, and of course the Baffin Bay Davis Straits area. And there's extensive uh, already uh, participation at, at, at community levels among uh, community organizations or NGO organizations to build a bottom-up strategy to be able to um, build a better adaptation strategy that fits where it has to be, that is, in these locales. It's due to to spin up very rapidly. It's been in the planning stage for two years. It is due to release its report in May of 2017 at the closure of the U.S. chairmanship. And I would say that it's really important that we educate our youth as to our issues and our, our concerns, our traditional cultural uses, as well as the longevity of the generations of usage into the process. We're actively doing that, as well as encouraging our 
our young ones to become educated in the process of technology before us. All of these things, we must be at both sides of these tables that are wanting to change the Arctic as well as understanding what's important to continue our traditions and culture into the future. We have uh, difficulties when we're left behind and our priorities are not kept at the decision-making table and the process lets uh, profitability at all costs affect the health of our people. Okay, Julie, any more questions? Let's hear it for our panelists. Thank you so much. And I believe we'll have a hyperwall presentation starting up um, at 12:30. So stick around for that, and our whole presentation um, uh, slides are up on the screen, so you can check out what we have for the rest of the day. Um, come back again. Thank you. Thank you all for everything. <laughs>